So our next speaker is Louise Giuseffi. Louise joined us as a NOAA employee from Hawaii who helped monitor the health of coral reefs in the tropical Pacific. She is leaving as a NOAA employee for the Antarctic Division here in San Diego. Although her career is taking her in the polar opposite direction from her research in this program, we know that the skills she has gained in the MAS program will serve her well in any direction she pursues. The title of her presentation today is Bridging Worlds, Can 3D Simulations Enhance Coral Restoration? What does time equal? Time equals money. And the use of 3D computer simulations to test the efficiency of how we collect coral reef metrics can save valuable time and money in the long run. I could never have guessed that a global pandemic would make my research all the more relevant and timely. In the current state of the world, where coral reef biologists cannot work in the field to monitor the health of coral reefs, I will present to you a novel approach using simulations to test the accuracy of different field methods in an effort to provide more precise results faster. In the broader context, this results in more effective coral conservation measures for the precious and limited time that researchers have underwater. Conserving coral reef ecosystems has global benefits, such as providing structure to buffer coastal societies from storms, recreation and tourism, and providing habitat for fish and invertebrates, and therefore safeguarding an important protein source for mankind. Finding ways in which we can live more sustainably with the ocean's nearshore ecosystems involves continued, continual monitoring, education, and evolving our uses of the ocean in response to changes in the environment. Coral restoration takes this a step further and corals are grown and planted back out on the reef to encourage a thriving ecosystem. The use of 3D technology to reconstruct and monitor the health of coral reefs is commonplace at the Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Stuart Sandin's lab is using imagery and innovative technology to archive reefs, but also as a method of tracking coral growth and death at stations all over the world. Before this technology existed, science measured individual corals with linear metrics like length and height, and two-dimensional metrics like percent cover. Scientists using this innovative 3D approach are still measuring two-dimensional metrics to maintain comparable data. The use of 3D imagery to collect surface area and volume could be a much more accurate and precise way of measuring corals and detecting growth, and I wanted to investigate aspects of this with my project. When I was a child, my mom would measure my height on the wall every birthday and half birthday. If she had measured me every month, she may or may not have detected a change in my height. If she had measured my volume every month, which would have been a pretty weird thing to do, changes in muscle mass would have made, whoops, in muscle mass would have made growth exponentially more apparent by adding this third dimension. The same applies to corals. Historically, we have been measuring growth with linear extension and tissue extension. By using surface area and volume, we could detect calcification or growth rates faster. This becomes an informative metric in the case of experimentation, giving valuation to damaged reefs, and in coral restoration. Another way that scientists describe the presence of a coral species on a reef is with percent cover from a top-down view. These two corals appear to take up roughly the same amount of space in a traditional percent cover context. But in the 3D model, you can see that the percent of the reef that they actually represent is vastly different. This is also the case for very large corals. This is myself and Big Mama in Ta'u, American Samoa. This is a Parietes species estimated between 500 and 800 years old. How difficult would it be to detect the rate of the coral's growth with height or percent cover? Before 3D imagery technology existed, a coral had to be removed to get surface area or volume. One could find the surface area by dipping the coral in paraffin wax, or find the volume by running it through a CT scan. With the technology we have today, we no longer need to remove the coral from its environment. 
Thank goodness, because I would like Big Mama to stay right where she is. In the scientific community, there is growing consensus that 3D metrics are more effective for capturing the complexity of coral reefs. Yet some concerns exist on the best practices, what the best practices should be for reconstructing reefs with 3D imagery. Pizarro and co-authors introduced a novel approach to photographing reefs with greater precision between rows by changing the flight path to a spiral. Marr and co-authors tested a variety of field techniques against reconstruction time. Depending on what the ultimate objectives of the project are and the availability of time and resources, there are trade-offs for every technique. One of the greatest caveats to address is the amount of precision available. If one reconstructs a complex branch in coral with low precision, the complexity is lost. It's like measuring a coral with a bag over it. The surface area will likely be underestimated and the volume overestimated. I wanted to know if our current methodology for collecting the 3D imagery of entire reef ecosystems for rapid assessment was sufficient or appropriate for collecting surface area and volume of individual corals. Do the current methods have enough precision to collect another dimension of metrics? Could some small tweak in a camera angle or distance from the bottom or a camera setting allow for more precise surface area and volume measurements? Well, there are already scientists who have begun experimenting with and using imagery to collect 3D metrics of individual corals. There is not a simulated field experiment, to my knowledge, to test the precision of the methods. So I learned to use an animation software called Blender to build a virtual world and animate the flight pathways, angle, percent overlap, distance from the bottom, and camera settings to simulate what we currently do in the field. From there, I changed small things to see what effect it had on the amount of data gathered and on 3D measurements, if any. I used the three flight pathways that I'm aware of, mowing the lawn, the grid, and the spiral. I first began experimenting with shapes to test if this was even feasible, and then I graduated to corals. To build or to borrow. I wanted to build the models of the corals for the simulation, but this proved to be an incredibly tedious task of editing away pieces of mesh, so I borrowed the other 3D coral models. I wanted to use the threatened species of the Caribbean elkhorn and staghorn corals, as there is already a significant amount of restoration work being done with these species. I also included a representation of a branching Pasolopora coral from Yap Condor's simulated growth experiments. I made a scene with coral models and objects for scale with known dimensions and measured surface area and volume in the animation software. I then built a camera track that mimics the flight path that the diver does with the camera in the field. In this example, it's the grid method. The camera animation is performed and the photos are taken. Then the photos are imported into Agisoft, a program that reconstructs 3D spatial data, and the scene is reconstructed with a cloud of pixels that overlap in multiple photos, recreating a three-dimensional reef scene through triangulation. From there, the surface area and volume of the corals are re-measured to see how much area exists for the different variables that I tested, the flight path, the camera angle, and the percent cover between photos. So during this project, I encountered a lot of technical difficulties. Texture, lighting, camera settings, they all really matter. And when something's off, the models turn out like this. A few times over the last quarter, I questioned my life choices in taking on this challenge, but that was always when I was on the verge of my biggest breakthroughs. I am still currently generating results, but the journey I've taken to get the results is the meat of the story I'm sharing with you today. So initially, I learned that shadows can lead to significant inaccuracies in 3D metrics. I learned that simulations with cameras at a 60-degree angle perform better qualitatively and quantitatively than cameras at a 90-degree angle, sometimes collecting three times the amount of data points. You see, when only looking from the top down, the height of the objects was skewed. Additionally, angling the camera increased the field of view, capturing more of the scene. In the field, there is no perfect 90-degree angle. The movement of the ocean 
The movement of the ocean moves the diver around, and therefore the image angle changes with the yaw, pitch, and roll of the camera. This likely enhances the coverage of the reef system. So I'm still writing the manual for the animation process, which is upwards of 50 pages. Don't worry, it's mostly pictures. Although I'm still generating results of the accuracy of surface area and volume estimates collected, there are some broad conclusions about the amount of data collected that can be drawn from each method. In addition to the 60 and 90 degree models made for each flight pattern, I also tested combining these models with only the even photos. This would be like having two cameras on the same frame at different angles and swimming twice as fast. Thus, each camera was taking half the amount of pictures. These split models collected more data points in all three scenarios. If I took all the photos from the 60 and 90 degree models together, it resulted in a slightly higher count of data points, but it took much longer to process. Time will tell when the surface area and volume results are in, if twice the amount of, data, if, of effort is worth it to increase the precision of these metrics. So next, I would like to 3D print coral with known surface area to test and compare the simulated findings with actual field work, because things are not perfect in the field. I'd like to expand the experiment to include many morphologies, shapes and sizes, and replicates of corals. And I'd like to work to perfect the simulated camera settings and find an ideal model for collecting surface area and volume which could look entirely different from the methods we are using currently to monitor, monitor entire reef systems. And this is just the beginning. I intend to build on this very simple model to make the simulations more and more realistic. And eventually, I'd like to publish my results. If proven comparable to results in the field, this simulation could be a tool to allow scientists to experiment with their field methods to improve their workflow. It has the potential to increase accuracy and speed of three-dimensional results, and without removing the coral from its environment to do so. This is especially useful during a pandemic when field operations have largely come to a halt. I would like to see the trajectory of this research result in the use of 3D simulations as an initial step during the research and development phase of new protocols. I hope that this project can serve scientists with time and resource limitations and ultimately to aid in coral conservation. And I'd like to give a big thanks to my committee who's helped me, um, to the 100 Island Challenge, to the MAS MBC Class of 2020, to Samantha and Risa, to my family and friends, to Noah for giving me the year off to pursue my master's degree, and to all of my NOAA coworkers, thank you so much for supporting me. Thanks, Louise. So we've got a few questions. Um, the first question is, you mentioned that there were challenges. What were some of the challenges you encountered when creating the animations? Sure thing. Uh, so the, the Elkhorn coral that I built, I had cut that out of um, a larger 3D picture, and it was, it was very tedious. Um, but also, the pictures have been collected looking straight down um, without the intent of collecting data from underneath. So, so there was large gaps in shadows, and so it wasn't a full coral. It was just a sheer veneer, like a piece of paper. So I ran it through the animation software, and gave it depth and blew up the data points so it actually would have a volume. Um, other issues I encountered was uh, making the spiral. So it turns out the animation software, there's not a way to make a perfect spiral um, that's equidistant between, between rows with a radius of eight centimeters. So that was a whole challenge in itself and that took me six hours to figure out. And Louise, if you had more time this quarter, what else would you have liked to have done with this project? Sure thing. So originally, I had wanted to include the field component, and I didn't know how that was going to work uh, with the pandemic um, and 
the way things were, people weren't allowed in the water at the time. Uh, so I wanted to 3D print the corals, and I was thinking of using a, a drone to fly over them to collect metrics that way. Um, but as it turned out, that was really ambitious for 10 weeks, and so figuring out the animation software took up a big chunk of my time. Great, and uh, this is a personal question of mine. I remember originally you were talking about maybe creating a, a hologram as well to go along with this. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about the hologram? Sure, um, that's something that I really still like to do. Um, so I had this idea to have a hologram incorporating five years of data from the Palmyra data set. Um, that is the longest one that I'm aware of. And zoom in on one coral and watch it grow over five years. Um, and you can do that with a prism. So it has four faces. And when you look inside the prism, it looks like a three-dimensional object. And that's a side project I'd still like to pursue at some point. Yeah, it sounds really cool. Um, and we do have a question that just came in from the web, too. How often was coral removed to measure it, and what impact did this have on coral reef health? Could your work prevent coral reef damage? Uh, I would certainly hope so. That was kind of a historical way of measuring coral reef surface area and volume. And in the past, there, there wasn't a way to, to measure these metrics. And now that we have this 3D technology, it's not necessary anymore. Great. Great, thank you.